Now, whether we like it or not, studying or learning is part of life. It's not just reserved for those who are in school or in the academic world. However, in our studying or learning, we learn or understand things in different ways. So this morning, I'm, I'm going to ask you, now in your studying or in your learning, are you a theoretical learner or a practical learner? Now, theore theoretical learners are those who are bookish. They, they love to read books. They love to collect and gather and analyze data. They like to do research, theoretical. But others are practical learners. In other words, they, they learn by being pragmatic, of course. In other words, by application or by seeing it in reality, hence on interactive. So let's make it interactive right now. Uh, allow me to do this. Now, if you are a theoretical learner, would you raise your hand? So, now if you are a practical learner, a hands-on kind of person in order to learn, would you raise your hand? Ah, now how many of you, just for the fun of it, how many of you are both? Oh wow, you can be theoretical and practical. Now open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32. Now, I introduce it that way because here, God is going to show us some practical means, practical examples of how to live differently from this world. Now, remember last week we learned from Ephesians 4, 17 through 24, some theoretical means or ways how to live differently from this world. And remember... We want to live differently from the world. Why? Because this world is anti-God. We certainly don't want to follow the pattern or the lifestyle of the world. Why? Because remember, we learned in chapter 4, verses 17 through 19, that this world is ungodly, filthy, evil, greedy, full of lust, so we certainly don't want to be following the lifestyle of the world. But remember how Paul shares with us some theoretical ways to no longer live like the world. He tells us to take off your old self. And then he also says, renew your mind. And he also says, put on your new self. But here in the verses that we're going to read, Paul is going to share with us some practical examples of how to live differently from the world. So in honor of the reading of the Word of God, let's all stand, please. We're going to read verses 4, or rather chapter 4, verses 25 through 32. And if you are there, say, I'm there. I'm there. If you're ready to read, say, let's read. Let's read. Verse 25, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, 
just as in Christ, God forgave you. You may be seated. Now at this point, the Apostle Paul had successfully transitioned from the practices of the Christian life in the church life. We, saw, we see those in verses 1 through 17 or 16 of chapter 4. In other words, those are the behaviors that we ought to be practicing when we're in the church. And we are together with other believers. And here in chapter 4, verses 17, all the way to chapter 5, verse 21, Paul is going to share with us some practices or behavior that we must do when we are alone or with other believers or when we are with non-believers. In other words, these are the practices of the Christian life in our personal life. <clears throat> and here, Paul, in living out your life differently from this world, he gives us some practical examples from the verses that we read. And, and just looking at it in my study, I, I believe these are the five actions or ways that we, we tend to do and we tend to fall or get our Christian life tripped up because of these five examples that he encourages us whether to do or not to do anymore. So these are the practical ways or hands-on that we can apply immediately in our life so we can live the Christian life different from this world. And the first one is this. Look at verse 25. Stop lying. I, I believe that's very practical example of how to live differently from this world. Why? Because this world is untruthful. Look at verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Paul is simply saying here, stop lying. No more dishonesty, no more untruthfulness. Why? Because when we lie, we simply hurt ourselves, no one else. But there are, of course, different types of lying. Lying is not just to be untruthful or to be dishonest. Lying is not just not to tell the truth. There are different forms of lying. When we exaggerate things, that's lying. Oh, I know how to fix a car, when truthfully you don't. Oh, I have read the Bible from the beginning to end. The truth is, you have not. Also, when we fabricate stories, that's lying. The former NBC News anchor of Channel 5 in our local station, Brian Williams, fabricated a story that when he was ready to give a report there in Iraq, while he was there, he got onto a helicopter and he was shot. That was a fabricated story. He was fired because of that. Or the, the, the one we, we have heard in the news, Jesse Smollett, who fabricated a story as well, saying that because he was a black gay living in Chicago, he was targeted by the pro-Trump or MAGA people. Uh, another fabricated story. But also when we make false promises. Oh, I will be there. And then you stood up the person. Mm -hmm. Or when you make promises that, I'll promise I will pay you back next week. Come on now. Come on <laughs> now. Did. Oh, yeah. But also, a form of lying is when we make excuses. Mm. Oh, I missed the church because you fill in the blank. Come on now. Because I, I was sick or I was not feeling well. When... The truth was, you just got lazy. Come on now, come on now. But, you know, we, we all experience that or, or do Stop. that. Now, this world is, is a lying world. Come on now. That's why come we don't now. want to live like the world, because the world is untruthful. Yes, sir. For example, according to a study made by Brandon Gale, the company says that in their study, by age four years old, by age four years old, a child knows the concept or the idea of lying. 
they begin to lie. 60% of adults in America cannot carry a 10-minute conversation without lying at least three times. Come on now, come on now, say that. Also, according to the study, most Americans lie at least 11 times per week. But here Paul clearly tells us we must stop lying. Why? Because look at verse 25 again. Because we are all members of one body. That means we are members of the body of Christ. We are members of the family of God. We are members of the kingdom of God. We must stop lying because God is not a God of lies. He's a God of truth. Christ is not a God of lies. He's a God of truth. So therefore, we must stop lying. And so, because now we belong to Christ, lying should not characterize our Christian life. Because it is pro-world. Now, not pro-word. Another practical example that he writes here is get over your anger quickly. Now, we all get angry from time to time. As a matter of fact, I would like to do a little interactive with us this morning. How many of you got angry this past week? I oh, did. I did. <laughs> all right. We all get angry from time to time. But anger in and of itself is not sin. Anger is not sin. Anger is a strong emotion that God has given us so we can express a righteous indignation or righteous anger, or we call it anger at evil or sin. But in and of itself, anger is not sin. Now, for instance, we get angry when there is a, we hear of a story of rape or abuse or bullying or murder or dishonesty we, we get ugh. you know we get angry yes, this past week i i got angry at my patient no, i didn't express it i just was angry on the inside uh -huh. why because part of what i do as a therapist in our initial assessment is we'll go in there and assess the patient but part of it is to check their memory their orientation so I would usually ask questions like, where are you right now? And uh, what date is it today? Or who's the president? Now for some reason, that gets very contentious. Oh. And so now I know, because I have been talking with this patient already, I knew that she is a Christian, and that she's active in the faith, and and she goes to this particular church. So I knew that already. But when I asked her, who's the president? And out loud, without putting any breaks, she said, oh, that BS? I mean, I just abbreviated it or used the acronym, but she said it, the full words. And then she added, that idiot? That kind of made me upset. But at the same time, I jokingly said to her, I didn't even know that Mr. Trump's first name is Idiot. I thought it was Donald. Come on now. Come I was on mistaken now. then. Come Inside on of me, I was angered by that because I, I was asking in my head, you may dislike this person, but what has he done to you personally Come for on you now. to hate him? Uh -huh. What is it that harm that this person has done to you for you to express this, this tremendous hate and, and disrespect? Because whether we like it or not, yes, whether sir. we like him or not, mm. Mr. S Mr. Trump was also created in the image of God. Come on now, yes, now according to Genesis 9 verse 6, that we are going to be responsible before God if we do something to one of his creations. Yes, sir. But once again, but anger in and of itself is not sin. Because look at verse 26. Paul said, in your anger, there it is, do not sin. So in your anger, he's not saying that you are angry, you are sinning, but in your anger, do not sin. So that means anger by itself is not sin, but when does it become sin? When does anger become sin? 
Well, look at the next verse, verse 26, or the next statement. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. So there it is. Anger in itself is not sin, but when we have a prolonged anger, when we have a lasting anger, when we are not able to cool off before the sun sets, when we're not able to overcome anger quickly, when we go to bed angry, when we stay mad and angry overnight, that's when it becomes sinful. It becomes a sinful anger. It, it becomes a hostile anger. Now, I believe to get over anger quickly is a very practical example of how to live differently from this world. Because this world is an angry world. Yes, it is. It's Say full that. of hate Say that. And, Say that. and division and disunity. And so certainly, we are Christians belonging to the family of God. We have our new Christian life, our new life, and certainly we don't want to be like the world. So we want to get over our anger quickly. But why? Why should I get over my anger quickly? Well, look at verse 27. He answers us. And do not give the devil a foothold. Mm -hmm. Aha. So now, we want to get over our anger quickly so we don't <coughs> give the devil a foothold. Now, what is a foothold? Now, in the original language of the scriptures, Greek, in the New Testament, this came from the Greek word tapos, where we get our English word topography, meaning a place or a seat. Or here, literally means an opportunity. So when we are angry, and it's a prolonged anger, it's a lasting anger, then we're giving the devil an opportunity yes, to sir. exploit yes, our anger mm -hmm. for his own purpose, to worsen our anger, and to allow him to make our anger a hostile and dangerous anger. That's right. Such That's as right. our anger could lead to revenge. Come on now. Come on now. Our anger could lead to Resentment. Yes, sir. Our anger could lead to bitterness towards someone that you really want to hurt this person bad. Come on now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we certainly don't want to give the devil a foothold. That's right. That's which right. we can say it this way. We don't want to give the devil a place in our life. Yes, sir. Would you like the devil to join you no, on your dining table? No, sir. No, sir. Of course not. Would you like the devil to have a seat in your life? No, sir. Certainly not. So here, a good practical example not to live like this world is by getting over our anger quickly. Mm -hmm. Look at the third one. Verse 28, don't be lazy. Mm -hmm. Don't be lazy. Now, allow me to expand on this a little bit more because if you would read the verse, you won't see the word lazy there. Mm. Allow me to explain it. Look at verse 28. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, mm. but must work doing something useful with his own hands, mm. that he may have something to share with those in need. Now, obviously, stealing in any form is sinful to God. So he tells us, steal no longer. But of course, there are different types of stealing, right? There's the embezzlement. Yes, There's cheating. Yes, or cheating, let's say, a government company or a, a, a IRS. There's also the pickpocketing and shoplifting and, and, and theft and, and robbery. There, there are different kinds of stealing. But stealing in any form is sinful. So here, Paul is emphasizing the Eighth Commandment in the de Decalogue of God, or the Ten Commandments, which is, you shall not steal. God did not change. Now, it's not because we are now living in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that we can just steal, and at night we can simply say, God, forgive me for stealing. Come on, man. Come now, on, God man. has not changed. That's He's right. an immutable God. He does not change. And so Paul is emphasizing, you shall not steal. But instead of stealing or theft, Paul said you must work with your hands. That's right, that's right. 
Now that expression with your hands is a metaphor, it's an imagery. He's not saying that you must work only with your hands, but not with your faith. Well, sometimes we do need our feet, don't we? Sometimes we do need our head in order to, to work. Sometimes we need our mouth. For instance, right now, I am working, but I'm using my mouth. And so here, Paul is simply saying that you use your hands as a metaphor, work. Does that make sense now, Mr. Bobby? Yeah, Mr. Bobby had a good discipleship yesterday, and we were talking about this verse. Mm -hmm. We both had an enlightenment period. And so Paul emphasized on the work. Now, I know a lot of people would say, I am not stealing, but I do work. I go to work once a week at Walmart. Come on, man. Oh, I don't work anymore because I'm retired. I understand that. Mm -hmm. but there's nothing wrong with that. Looking forward for that time that I would also retire. Or we say, hey, I, I work at my work three days a week. Hmm. So I work. I'm not stealing anything. Come on now. Come on now. But here, the word work is from the Greek word, which literally means to work very, very hard. Mm -hmm. Or to, the, to labor to the point of exhaustion. Or to work to the point of weariness. So what Paul is saying here is, don't just say, I work. You work very hard. Why? So you can support yourself, support your family, and watch this, he said, so you can help those who are in need. Because he said, if you simply work, then you can, yeah, support yourself, but if you work very hard, then you can support those who are also in need. But to work hard to the point of exhaustion or fatigue is, is like this. So on Thursday, I decided to move uh, the, the, the pile of dirt in our backyard mm -hmm. because there is this, this dip or the, this hollow that's growing in our church backyard. And, and I have asked uh, Renee and John to, uh, to move the dirt. We ordered some dirt, not the best dirt because it has lots of rocks and we even found, you know, wood in there and, and all sorts of hard stuff. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, a cheap dirt. Come on, Good right. enough just to cover the hollow or the dip there in our backyard. And, and so they started working on that project. But, but I know that they are in a circumstance that it would be hard for them to finish it. So I decided I'm going to do it myself mm -hmm. and move that pile of dirt into the hollow in the ground. But of course, my precious loving wife here won't let me do that on my own. Come on now. So on Come Thursday on afternoon after my work, we came here to church and we decided to move the pile of dirt. Uh, one thing that I or my wife did not realize is because it's been sitting there for a while, that soil, that dirt, that hole. became compact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so we were shoveling, we were hoeing, we were raking, that so we can just move it into the hollow. And for about an hour and a half, me and my, my wife doing it, and the sun bearing down on us, we got exhausted. <laughs> I never worked so hard, even in my physical therapy career, that I would transfer patients big and heavy. I've never been so exhausted as last Thursday, hmm. to the point that we could, we could hardly walk back to our car. Mm -hmm. We were just aching from head to toe. We were just so exhausted. But as soon as we get home, we took a shower, and we just, boom, lie down. Because we were so exhausted. That's the point that Paul is saying here. Steal no longer, but work hard. Mm -hmm. And look at what he also said in 2 Thessalonians 3. 10 through 12. He said, if a man will not work, work hard, he shall not eat. We hear that some of, among you are idle or lazy. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Come on, man. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the bread they eat. Work hard. Now you may argue, hey, I, I, I work hard. I am not stealing, but I believe a form of stealing is this, laziness. Yes, sir. 
slothfulness. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I think it's a form of stealing because if you are just inflating your own self and inflating your own laziness or slothfulness, then you are stealing from someone else's money, effort, skill, in order to support and make you convenient and work less. And, and this world promotes laziness. That's right, that's right. It does promote laziness. For instance, this world allows young and strong panhandlers to roam around and beg for money. That's you right. don't serve them. Oh, yeah. Some of them are young in their 20s, that's right. stronger than me. Come on, have the ability to stand in one place, walk back or walk back and forth mm -hmm. for hours and hours in the heat of the day that's and right. yet never get tired. Come on now. And yet this guy that Irene and I, we always see at Sam's Club there in Grand Prairie. Is it Sam's Club or Walmart? At Walmart. And he's paralyzed on one side. Hmm. But guess what? He, would, he still works at Walmart and he would drag his right arm and his right leg and he would push the push cart back into the store. And he would go back there again and get another one and push it back to earn a living. Hmm. He's certainly not being lazy. But this world promotes laziness because it agrees with issuing inappropriate disability checks to able-bodied people. Come on people. now, you know what we saying. know that. That's right. I mean, I know that there are people who are legal hmm. and certainly deserving of disability checks. But I know a lot of people stronger than me, younger than me, able-bodied, and yet they don't work. That's right. That's right. Why? Because they applied for a disability. Why? Because they said, I cannot work anymore. I have an ingrown toenail. I deserve paycheck from the government. This world promotes laziness because it supports the attitude of being entitled. I don't have to work. The government has to pay me. Because why? Because I am a citizen of this country. This world promotes laziness. And yet God encourages us, even commands us, to work hard. He doesn't want us to be lazy. He wants us to work hard so we can support our own self, our family, but also the people who are in need. We certainly don't want to be lazy. Why? Because look at the consequence of laziness. Proverbs 6, 10 and 11. A little sleep, a little slumber... A little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come on you like a bandit and scarcity like an armed man. We become very poor. We become very needy because of our laziness. Fourth practical example of living different from this living differently from this world is no more bad language. Now, this world advocates profanities, cuss words. Fighting words, pervasive words, perverse words, corrupt words. Look at verse 29. Paul writes, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. In other words, Paul is simply saying here, No more bad language. Only speak what is beneficial or good or positive that would encourage other people, especially other Christians. Now, I love the word unwholesome. Look at that verse once again, verse 29. And if you don't mind, say this word with me, unwholesome. Unwholesome. Now, let's do that again. Unwholesome. Unwholesome. Now, when you look at it, it's like there's really nothing wrong with it. What's unwholesome? Now, we have to look at it from the original language of the New Testament. Once again, Greek. This word came from the Greek word sarpos, which literally means this. A rotten fruit, rotten fish, filthy, corrupt, or rotten, rancid. So Paul is using he, this word to refer to a rotten fish. Now, we know the smell of the rotten fish. That's right. Right? That's right. That's I tell you what. It is hard for me and my wife to get our kids to go to an Asian market or to the Asian or Oriental store because, well, I don't blame them. As soon as you get to the door and the sliding doors open, I mean, there's this pungent odor, isn't it? Yeah, oh, man, it hits you. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so, of course, as she moved inside the store, and then as she got back to the seafood area, I mean, that odor becomes very, very strong. And so they begin to act and react. Ah, ah this is disgusting. Now, of course, of course, not all, not all, all Asian stores have that pungent odor or smell. If you go to H, uh, H Mart or uh, 99 Ranch in Carrollton, that those are pretty good, clean Asian stores. So we love going there, and they love going there. We pretty much go there every Sunday. But that's what Paul is saying here. It's it's remarkable to me. That even myself, I, I grew up in a country where going to the fish market is common and I smell that all the time. But somehow, now here of late, when I enter the Asian market, you know, especially here in Arlington, I, no, no, I, 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 I tend to kind of not want to go in there also. Because just this, this is the smell of, of the fish. And, and listen, those fish are not rotten fish. Come on now. Yes, sir. But Paul is saying here... The word unwholesome thought is like you are speaking with your mouth filled with rotten fish. That's stinky. Do you know that our church used to meet there on Cooper Street in a barber shop? And in front of it is this international food house or food court. And they cook some, some um, ethnic foods in there. And it's fine. It sometimes just smells pretty good. But behind the building, we only have one dumpster in there. And, and once I opened the, the dumpster and, and I was throwing away our trash, and when I opened it, boy, flies came out. And then not only that, the smell, oh, I nearly threw up. That's what Paul is saying here. An awesome thought is not just, not, not just saying in appropriate language, but we speak with rotten fish in our mouth. And in this word, or this world speaks that way. I mean, I mean it's, it's okay for us or for people to, to say bad things uh, verbally or in social media. We hear a lot of profanities and cuss words and, and, and perverse words and words with sexual innuendos and, and racial slurs and, and abusive language and using God's name in vain. Folks, all of those are bad language. Yes, sir. And because yes, sir. we have this Christian life now, we have this new life, that should not characterize our Christian life That's right. That's anymore. Right. Instead, we should speak with words that are beneficial. Look at that verse. That would benefit those who would hear our words. So, so that means those are good words. In other words, those are positive words. Let's try to work on saying positive words. Let's say words like, hey, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Or maybe say some, some more encouraging words. You can do it. I know you can. Or say more of gracious words. God is with you. Come on God now. is with you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Or say some words or uplifting words or loving words like I love you. <laughs> Let's say I love you more. As a matter of fact, if you are sitting next to a person, tell that to your church mate. Say I love you. I love you. I love you in the Lord. You see, see, all of a sudden we're all smiling. But watch this now. Watch this now. See now, see it's it's good when we speak, we speak life into a person. Yes, sir. When we speak life instead of death to a person, it just brings them life and it builds them up. Let me give you an example. Tell the person next to you, I'm proud of you. I'm so proud. Of you. Look at you. So proud. Look at you. You're all smiling. You're all so happy. Why? Because suddenly you gave why to that person. And let's move on to the last one. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now the word grieve literally means this, to, to be sorrow. It's a deep pain or, or hurt. It means we cause mourning or we bring a person to the point of tears. That's, that's the word grieve there in the original language. In, in other words, this word is similar to the sorrow or the grief that we have when a loved one passed away. Or when a dear friend died. We have this grief and sorrow and just like this 
this text message that I received from one of our members, Cynthia Brown. Now, she texted me this past week, and she said that they experienced a tragic loss. That her niece, 30 years old, and her niece's children, 10-month-old and 20-month-old, all died mm. in a car accident. Mm -hmm. And now, the niece's husband is in the hospital in Louisiana and fighting for his life. Come on now, get stuck. But I was feeling in the text message her grief and sorrow. Oh, and yes. so that's what Paul is saying here. Can you imagine we bring grief or sorrow to the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. the, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the creator of the universe, the, the very God Himself. Hmm. You know, the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. Yes, the Holy Spirit who is our comforter, our counselor, our paraclete. The one who is called alongside of us. Our Amen. teacher, our guide, our empowerer. This powerful God called the Holy Spirit. We can make Him cry. When do we do that? When we do displeasing things to God. Look at what it says in verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That simply means that the Holy Spirit is also the guarantor or the deposit assuring us of our eternal life. We can be secure of our eternal life because we have the Holy Spirit in us. Oh, yeah. Now, do you have the Holy Spirit in you? Yes, I hope so because that's God's deposit to assure you that when your time is up on earth, you're going to heaven. Why? Oh, no. Because you have Jesus in you yes, and sir. that comes in the form of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. now, but when do we grieve the Holy Spirit? When do we make this God cry? Look at verse 31. Get rid of all bitterness. Mm -hmm. That means grudge. Resentment. I hope you are not holding any grudge. Oh, yeah. Rage and anger. Mm -hmm. It means uncontrolled temper. Brawling. Fighting. Slander. Evil talk against someone. Along with every form of malice. That's the desire to harm. That's why Paul said get rid of those sinful and selfish behaviors. Why? Because they all lead to us grieving the Holy Spirit. He said, he said, we must desire to please the Holy Spirit. How? With living a sanctified life, sanctified meaning holy, mm -hmm. and selfless life. Look at verse 32. Be kind and compassionate mm -hmm. to one another. Why is that? Because here's the truth. Why should we show kindness to people and compassion? Because all people are having a hard time. Yes, sir. Every person is having a hard time. Mm -hmm. When someone tells you, Oh, my life is fine and dandy. Oh, my life is great. Come on, my man. I have no burden, no problem whatsoever. Man. My life is wonderful. Listen, you know that person's burden is? Mm. Lying. That's right. That's right. Everyone is having a hard time, so we must show mm -hmm. kindness and compassion. And it goes on by saying, along with every form of malice, in 32, be compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. Hey, are you still holding on to that grudge or bitterness or resentment with what that person did to you last week? No. Last month? No. Two years ago? No. What is, what is forgiveness? Have you ever thought of that? Okay, I say I forgive. What does it mean? Now, in the scriptures, the word forgive literally means this, to let go of the wrong. Mm -hmm. So imagine, let's say I'm holding something in my hand and I just drop it. That's forgiveness in imagery. Or it means, let's say you're holding onto a balloon and you let's just let it fly in the sky. That's forgiveness. Forgiveness is to let go, to set yourself free from the grudge jail. I think some of you are living in the grudge sale. Come on now. Come on now. I mean, it's okay to do a garage sale. Come on now. Just get out of the grudge jail. Yes, sir. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. So forgive. <laughs> because when we forgive, that's living sanctified or holy and you being selfless. Now, those are the five practical examples of how to live differently from this world. Now, let me tell you about Tony Dungy. How many of you have heard of Tony Dungy? Tony Junji was a retired 
former NFL coach, great coach, who won the Super Bowl with the Indianapolis Colts. But he said his, his philosophy in coaching is simple, and it's this, no more excuses, just execute. No more excuses, just execute. In other words, he doesn't like it when his player would be in the field and would mess up, and so he would come back to sideline and say, Coach, I'm sorry about that. I, I did this and that. He doesn't like to hear that. He would simply tell them, no more excuses, just execute. Mm -hmm. Folks, last week, God has given us theoretical means how to live differently from the world. Mm -hmm. Today, God has given us practical examples of how to live differently from the world. So when it comes to living differently from this world, God is saying this to us. No more excuses. That's right. Just That's execute. Right. Yes, sir. Because now we know from a theoretical standpoint and practical standpoint how to live differently mm -hmm. from this world. Amen. Let's pray.